Fairy tales are, without a doubt, one of the most popular themes that can be found in entertainment. For example, you can visit Rock City, a scenic mountain trail located in Lookout Mountain, Georgia. It's an attraction interesting enough to make an entire video on just itself, but to follow the theme of fantasy, there's a section of trail called Fairyland Caverns, which features blacklight dioramas depicting popular western fairy tales. There's something about this type of fantasy that is immersive in an uncanny way. Something that is at once magical and atmospheric, but could be unnerving to some. It's one of my favorite themes because of the strange feeling it can invoke, and Rock City is worth a visit if you're interested in this type of entertainment. Fairy tales have been pretty popular in the United States despite originating in Europe, and have also found themselves included in theme parks. For example, Busch Gardens Tampa has historically included a children's area called the Dwarf Village, featuring dioramas of popular fairy tales until 1995 when it was rethemed. While not following any particular story, the retheme to the Land of Dragons featured that same style of fantasy atmosphere and charm, with a few small rides included. Of course, it wouldn't make sense to discuss the popularity of European fairy tales in the United States without discussing Disney. I'm sure that a large reason these stories continue to have cultural relevancy is due to Disney's animated library, and I'm sure that Disneyland's Fantasyland played a large part in inspiring attractions at other parks. If you've ever been on any of these rides or their mostly extinct counterparts in the Magic Kingdom, you'll understand the charm and atmosphere that these attractions can invoke. Today though, I'm interested in moving away from parks in the United States, instead focusing on the ultimate fantasy park. A place with incredible but often bizarre and unnerving theming and experiences that is sure to intrigue any fan of themed entertainment. Join me today as we explore Efteling of the Netherlands, and see how a dedication to themed experiences has resulted in some of the best attractions that the world has ever seen. The park we see today is ambitious in quality and scope, but had its humble origins in the early 20th century. In 1933, Chaplain Ritra and Pastor D. Kleijin formulated an idea for a sports complex. Located just south of the village Catchable in the Netherlands, this park would open in 1935 with four football pitches and a year later would install a playground. The park would continue to expand until 1950 when it was incorporated into the Efteling Nature Park Foundation with the goal of stimulating local recreational activity and attracting tourism. As part of the effort to bring in tourists, a walkthrough exhibit called Fairy Tale Forest was conceptualized with the help of filmmaker Peter Reingiers, who in turn enlisted the help of artist Anton Peake. In 1952, the Fairy Tale Forest opened to the public featuring depictions of popular stories derived from Sleeping Beauty, Snow White, The Frog Prince, The Magic Clock, The Chinese Nightingale, The Naughty Princess, The Six Servants, The Gnome Village, Mother Hall, and We Walter Message. Throughout the history of the park, new scenes have been added, supplementing the strange charm of this area and it continues to exist today as a staple attraction even among the various rides. My audience consists mostly of Americans, and so as Americans we tend to be familiar with fairy tales such as Sleeping Beauty and Snow White, no doubt because of Disney. However, the fairy tale forest features quite a large number of these stories that are more familiar to a European audience. One of my favorites has to be a small story about three sons with an enchanted table, club, and donkey. The donkey is depicted here, shooting out a coin every time you lift its tail. As I stated earlier, most fairy tales are depicted in such a way as to often creep into uncanny territory, and that's certainly the case here. 
For example, there's a depiction of the character Longneck from The Six Servants, whose neck is so long that he's capable of seeing halfway around the world. In my opinion, the most terrifying fairy tale depicted is The Wolf and the Seven Kids. It's about a family of goats who are visited by a predatory wolf who comes disguised in a suit. The fairy tale forest offers 25 scenes in total, derived from various stories, and each delivers in a strange and eerie way. It's a fascinating attraction in and of itself, and has set the charming but otherworldly fantasy theme of the park. This theme can be found everywhere, from the hedge maze that premiered in 1995, to the trash receptacles found around the park. Having debuted in 1959, these receptacles were themed to feature a character known as the Paper Gobbler, who shops for paper as you pass on by. In 1966, the fairy tale forest would receive a small animatronic show called the Indian Water Lilies. The success of this depiction would inspire the next major attraction to come to the park in 1978. Built to bring visitors to the South End, Spookslot is a much more ambitious animatronic show that takes place in a haunted, ruined castle. As you descend into the darkness of the castle, the queue provides a number of macabre elements, such as this door that reacts violently when you attempt to pull on it. Other unique elements include this shelf with skulls, the Wailing Ghost, an illusion featuring a head eating a spider, and this room called the Round Hall, lit by a chandelier held by the finger of a grotesque arm. Occasionally, lightning will flash, and devilish bat-like creatures called flatterers will appear, descending upon the audience before suddenly disappearing. Finally, guests witness a supernatural entity known as the Eastern Spirit deliver an expository setup for the show. The story essentially relates that the 4th Viscount of Catchable lived in the castle while collecting fairy tales and practicing magic. He was hated by a local witch, who, stalking the grounds disguised one day, was discovered by the castle gardener and was condemned to be burned at the stake by three judges. With her last breath, she cursed all who condemned her and tainted the magic of the castle. From here, guests move into the viewing area as they wait for the next show to start. The premise is that you're watching the curse play out as it does every night since time immemorial. This is initiated by a character known as the Enchanted Crow, who begins by ringing a bell. Consequently, the corpse of the cursed gardener bobs up and down as the bell continues to ring. Next, the three judges who condemn the witch appear, cursed to repeat their verdict every single night. Once these events play out, a procession of ghostly monks move through the corridor, and once finished, an ethereal violin begins playing and initiates the famous French piece, Danse Macabre. From this point, the catacombs come to life through a number of practical and animatronic effects synced to the music and ghostly figures appear using a Pepper's ghost effect. We can also see the witch chained to a plank be consumed by flames, also achieved through the Pepper's ghost effect. From here, the piece ends and audiences exit the castle. Spookslot is, without a doubt, one of the most intriguing attractions I've ever seen. Its story isn't based on a fairy tale, but fits in well with the already established theme. The entire experience is incredibly powerful and atmospheric, taking into consideration its well-constructed lighting, practical effects, and fantastic sound design. Spookslot might appear to be a bit dated today, but I also think that's part of the charm. It also stands as a milestone for the development of Efteling, really marking the point where it switched from gardens and recreation to a contemporary theme park. The next major addition to the park would be in 1981 with the steel coaster Python. Manufactured by Vacoma, Python strangely lacks the dark and whimsical theming of the rest of the park. The first steel coaster with an inversion was manufactured by Arrow and premiered at Knott's Berry Farm in 1975 as Corkscrew. The Corkscrew model was cloned 10 times and was placed at various parks, each receiving a significant attendance boost when the coasters debuted. Vacoma, on the other hand, specialized in farming and mining equipment, but developed a working relationship with Arrow in the 1970s 
to manufacture steel coaster track in Europe. However, Vekoma would move into the amusement park industry itself in 1979, which is why Vekoma coaster track looks so similar to Arrow. Python followed the trend of adding a steel looping coaster as a major attraction into a park, and so that would explain the lack of theming. At this point, Efteling may have had the fairy tale forest and spook slot, but the dark fantasy theming was not yet a staple of the park. As the industry continued to grow over the years, Python became a shaky and uncomfortable relic of the past, but was an intimidating coaster for its time. Efteling is very much a park that appreciates its own history, and so Python was almost completely retracked by CSM and reopened in 2018 as a much smoother and enjoyable experience. It may lack thematic cohesion with the rest of the park, but I can appreciate a classic coaster when I see one. From this point forward though, Efteling really began to run with its nostalgic and fantasy themes in the 1980s. For example, Old Tufer is described by the park as a classic car ride that provides a scenic tour of Efteling. Along the way, the early 20th century theming is charming and oftentimes pretty funny. This classic attraction opened in 1984, and did so alongside the park's first dark ride. Called Carnival Festival, this might be the only attraction I actively dislike in the park. The premise is that guests are being taken on a tour of the world, but the different countries and regions are depicted in a humorous carnival style. The claim is often made that this attraction was heavily inspired by Disney's It's a Small World, and I don't really disagree from watching it. However, whereas I really like Small World and I think it has a lot of depth, this attraction is the opposite. I find the art style to be obnoxious and overwhelming, and for being a world tour, it's quite Eurocentric. I also understand the claim that people find the music of Small World to be an annoying earworm, but this is just... I, I hate it. Carnival Festival also has some incredibly problematic depictions as well. When the ride moves into Asia, the Japanese and Chinese are depicted with buck teeth. This is a common element of yellowface, which, if you haven't deduced, is the East Asian equivalent to blackface. Another scene depicts the Chinese with spinning plates, while American tourists ogle at them. I'm not sure if the scene is making any sort of commentary, but it's problematic nonetheless. After this, the attraction moves into a section called the Arctic, where Inuit people with an igloo from the Northern Hemisphere are depicted alongside penguins, which are found exclusively in the Southern Hemisphere. It's not overtly racist, but I'm not giving it a pass. Next, the attraction moves to Africa, where the native people are depicted as jungle savages. Behind them is a giant ape wearing a bowler hat, and I don't think it's meant to mean anything, but considering the portrayal of the Africans, you can see how certain conclusions can be drawn. The attraction ends with a small scene dedicated to Mexico and to Hawaii, and then has a spinning table with different nationalities represented saying goodbye. An attraction like this would not exist in the United States today. Sure, Small World has its issues with depicting stereotypes of different nationalities, but it's not at all like this. I also understand that as a nationally and culturally diverse country, the United States is far more aware of problematic depictions of other peoples. However, Carnival Festival is the equivalent of Small World depicting everyone in the Africa scene in blackface. I know it's a product of its time, and the Netherlands isn't exactly the most diverse country, but I'm sure there has to be some degree of controversy around this. And you know what? After I'd finished typing all of this out, I found out that the attraction was refurbished in 2019 to address the majority of these problematic depictions. So you know what? Good on you, Efteling, but I'm not changing what I typed because this attraction has stayed this way for 34 years, and it deserves to be highlighted as an example of what not to do. Even with the fixes, I usually can't appreciate most dark rides, but I cannot stand the art direction here. I will continue to praise Efteling for its incredible attractions, but this is going to be the exception. The 1980s was definitely the largest period of expansion for the park. Following the other attractions, 1985 would bring in Swiss Bob, manufactured by Intamin. 
The only theming here is the station, but a bobsled coaster does feel like an appropriate complement with the European fantasy theme of the park. The attraction was demolished in 2019 and was replaced with a pair of dueling power coasters called Max and Moritz in 2020. It's odd to see two powered coasters, and even more rare to see them dueling. Both of these coasters also run through their respective stations, picking up speed the second time around. This attraction is cute for what it is, but there's not much more to say about it. Following the Swiss Bob though, 1986 would bring in the next classic dark ride to the park. Today, known as Fata Morgana, it's a boat dark ride manufactured by Intamin and is themed to the 1001 Arabian Nights. For those unfamiliar, the Arabian Nights is a collection of 1001 stories from around the Mediterranean and the Middle East that often evoke a dark but magical mythology that fits right in with the European fairy tales of the park. The attraction starts as you move into a lush jungle, where you witness a magical city disappear, or a Fata Morgana, as the attraction is named after. The boat continues moving through the jungle until guests encounter a wizard, who opens the way to the magical city. Fata Morgana was primarily designed by creative director Tan Bain Deven, who was reportedly inspired by Disneyland's Pirates of the Caribbean. The narrative goes that he wanted to create a boat ride that depicts a number of loosely related scenes and that the dark and whimsical Arabian Nights served heavily as inspiration. As far as I can tell, no scene borrows from any story in particular, but one could imagine that they're traveling through medieval Baghdad. The scenes range in tone from being dark and suspenseful to portraying humor and decadence. Of course, the magical nature of the attraction wouldn't be complete without encountering a djinn. Like pirates, Fata Morgana excels in its sense of atmosphere, providing a number of special effects ranging from the lavish smells of the Medina streets to illusions and tricks that mislead the audience. There is, at once, humor and gags, but the guests might also find themselves in situations full of danger and suspense. While Fata Morgana's animatronics have not aged the best, I certainly feel that it's a fantastic and classic attraction regardless. This monorail is taking guests through an area called the People of Laugh. While a number of smaller attractions would be added to Efteling in the late 1980s, this area with its fantasy-inspired village would work as the next step in solidifying the often unnerving and yet curious magical theme. Premiering in 1990, it's often considered a walkthrough kids area because it has slides and distorting mirrors, but I'm primarily interested in the atmosphere and various scenes playing out. There's also an element of exploration, in that you can walk into many of the structures and find interactive elements. I personally find walkthrough attractions to be highly underrated, and this area evokes a similar feeling to the fairy tale forest. It's easy to get caught up in the latest and greatest technological advances in attraction design, but there's often a charm to simpler and more rudimentary attractions. One of the greatest strengths of the People of Laugh is its atmosphere. And while Efteling in general excels in this area, I think it's important that these smaller and less exciting attractions not be overlooked. Over the next few years, Efteling would continue to expand with the opening of the Efteling Hotel in 1992, and a new entrance area in 1996. Called the House of the Five Senses, each point corresponds with sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell and is meant to evoke the idea that Efteling works to stimulate all the senses as part of the experience. Speaking of taste, Efteling offers a number of dining locations with excellent theming. For example, Poe's Kuken is a themed dining location that specializes in Dutch pancakes. Efteling also offers other experiences that incorporate theming and the food quality is reportedly pretty good. The 1990s were a pretty active decade for the expansion of Efteling. In 1996, Villa Volta would premiere as a madhouse flat ride with heavy theming, manufactured by Vacoma. The story of the attraction is based around the legend of the Buck Riders, a fierce gang of Dutch robbers who made a pact with the devil and flew through the sky on goats. Villa Volta is the home of the leader of the gang, known as Hugo. 
Following the robbery of the Abbey of Pastel, an ethereal woman places a curse on both him and the house, resulting in the chaos each night. His curse is to never live in peace, hence the house rolling about the riders. In 1998, the park would debut the indoor coaster Vogel Rock, manufactured by Vacoma. Inspired by the story of the second voyage of Sinbad from the Arabian Nights, the coaster takes guests past a number of special effects and models of the rock, a giant bird found in Middle Eastern mythology. As far as I can tell, the attraction doesn't seem to have any discernible story, and the focus is more on the thrill of the coaster, although poor reception to the attraction did lead to a refurbishment in 2007. During this time, the key was changed to bring guests through a cave where they could see the bones of an elephant, the food source of the mighty rock. Later in the queue, the giant egg of the rock can be viewed in a temple. While Volga Rock, Villa Volta, the people of Laf, all created under the direction of Van de Ven, I might add, and the many other expansions were great for Efteling in the 1990s, the most interesting attraction had opened in 1993. Known in English as Dreamflight and another project from Van de Ven, this amazing dark ride manufactured by Translift takes riders through a series of five immersive fantasy scenes in hanging cabins. As the ride starts, you move into the castle realm, which depicts a miniature diorama of a fantastical mountain range dotted with fantasy castles. It also includes a waterfall and enchants guests with a smell feature of moist vegetation. Efteling actually offers an attraction simply called the Diorama, developed by both Anton Peake and Van de Ven that opened in 1971. Here an extensive and detailed diorama 60 meters in length is on display. Dioramas are something that have always fascinated me and fit in perfectly with the fairy tale theme. The castle realm is reportedly inspired by unused sketches for the diorama penned by Van de Ven and so it shares that connection. What I also find really intriguing is how the diorama is used as an effective method of providing forced perspective as you fly over these distant castles. Next, the ride moves through a cave and into the wondrous forest, a highly detailed scene that includes fairies, satyrs, a unicorn, and a troll-like creature called a squelch. It's one of those things where the more you look, the more you tend to notice. Guests move through another cave and this time emerge into a scene called the Fairy Garden, here, you move around and watch the fairies relaxing and playing around the spring. As you near the end, you encounter the troll king Oberon, who is the sovereign of the fairies derived from medieval and renaissance literature. As the scene ends, you move into a star tunnel with transformative lighting effects. Now in space, guests move past another diorama known as the Heavenly Strongholds, depicting a series of floating fantasy structures and inhabited moons. From here, the ride vehicles move into a dark tunnel and emerge into the last scene, known as the Squelch Forest. Here, guests can witness the mischievous antics of squelches and trolls in the forest as it rains. The ride vehicle circles the room and moves continuously downward, revealing more of the scene as it descends. The attraction concludes as guests encounter some more fairy tale creatures and move into a dark tunnel back to the station. Like Fata Morgana, Dreamflight's strength is its sense of atmosphere and the intricacy of its scenes. It doesn't need an overall narrative to be a great dark ride. If you're a Disney fan, you've probably heard the story of how the early concept for Pirates was perceived as being too busy for guests to take in. The story goes that Walt Disney himself disagreed, thinking that the detail and subtleties of the scenes would give guests a reason to come back and ride it again. Both Fata Morgana and Dreamflight fit into this classic dark ride design philosophy. For example, moving through the wondrous forest scene, try to find as many hidden details and characters as you can. It's rare to find an attraction that focuses more on atmosphere and wonder today. Instead, narrative-driven attractions that incorporate a lot of action are all the rage, and while not inherently bad, tend to oversaturate parks to the point of becoming tedious. Sometimes, it's better to have an attraction that is concerned more with intricate scenes and set dressing with a powerful sense of atmosphere. 
That's why Efteling, with its continued dedication to maintaining its classic dark rides, serves as an example of a park with an exceptional lineup of fascinating experiences. As Efteling moved into the 21st century, quality experiences would continue to be added to the park. To commemorate the 50th anniversary of the park, a 4D theater would be added in 2002 called Panda Dream. The premise is that guests join a panda as it explores the beauty of the natural world through a dream. While not particularly interesting, at least to me, the show did let out into a detailed and well-themed quick-service restaurant called The Octopus. Panda Dream concluded its run in April 2019, and was replaced with a film called Fabula in December of the same year. The concept is incredibly similar, with a bear and a squirrel visiting the habitats of other animals through a dream. The new Fabula restaurant also manages to preserve a lot of the theming from the previous iteration, which is a plus, I think. The next major addition to the park would be a water coaster in 2007, known as the Flying Dutchman, and manufactured by Kumbach. Guests enter into a well-themed building, and the atmospheric queue offers a lot of interesting elements. The story of the attraction starts with a character named Willem van der Decken, who is the commander of the ship called the Dutchman of the Dutch East India Company. However, despite being a wealthy trader, greed gets the better of him and he starts to practice piracy, recruiting his crew from orphanages. On Easter in the year 1678, he sets sail in spite of the Holy Day and sails right into an approaching storm, meeting damnation and is cursed to sail the seas forever. The queue starts in van der Decken's house, and eventually moves into the smuggler's tunnels where his stashed treasure can be seen. From the tunnels, guests move through the queue into the cellar of a pub and eventually outside into the harbor under a dark, clouded sky. Guests board a boat and move through a tunnel, merging into another section of the harbor featuring docked ships. From here, the boat moves out into the pitch black sea, where fog and wind effects create an impending sense of doom. Traveling through the fog, a strange ethereal noise can be heard, and a strike of lightning reveals the fearsome Flying Dutchman to be on course to intercept the boat. The guests are enveloped in darkness again briefly, until they suddenly find themselves being swallowed up by the Dutchman and fall down a short drop, before entering a lift hill. Here, the guests encounter the captain, before escaping outside the show building and running through a brief but tame coaster segment. Despite the intense, supernatural theming, the Flying Dutchman is considered a family coaster and ends in a splashdown, which can be adjusted to have a smaller impact in the colder months of park operation. From here, the boat wanders around the waterfront until it enters a tunnel and returns to the station. The attraction is often criticized for being short, but I have to admit that the theme and show effects are a huge draw for me. The queue and interior portions of the ride also seem to just ooze atmosphere, which I of course expect from any Efteling attraction. In 2010, a new dueling wooden coaster called George and the Dragon would premiere at the park. It replaced the 1991 addition to the park called Pegasus, which was also a wooden coaster. Originally manufactured by Din Corporation until the employees went on strike, the coaster was finished by Intamin and lacked theming. The coaster just seems to be okay, until its replacement appears to be an overall improvement. George and the Dragon was manufactured by GCI, and is themed to a dragon that terrorizes the kingdom of what I presume is either a knight or possible monarch named George. Riders can choose either side, one themed to water and the other to fire. Whichever coaster wins, banners will drop in the station and a fanfare will play. In general, George and the Dragon seems to be considered an okay GCI coaster, but what makes it fun is the dueling aspect and the theming. 
When the attraction opened, the dragon would raise its head and breathe fire into the air. However, it seems to have stopped since, for reasons I cannot seem to find. The next coaster to premiere at the park would be Baron 1898, which is a dive coaster manufactured by B&M and premiered in 2015. As with George and the Dragon, Baron is certainly not the most exciting of its coaster type out there, as the layout leaves a bit to be desired when compared to other models. However, Efteling always makes up for the shortcomings with theming. The story of the attraction is that in 1898, the wealthy Baron Gustav Hugmoed discovers a cave full of gold deposits that is haunted by entities known as the White Women. One of the spirits warns the Baron that if he disturbs the gold, he will suffer and be cursed for the remainder of his life. In an attempt to bypass the spirits, he tempts the impoverished locals with work in the mine, where they often suffer from terrifying supernatural events or are even chased out. As guests enter into the mining offices, they encounter a pre-show that is interrupted by the white women and then move to a second pre-show where they encounter the Baron, encouraging them to disregard the supernatural speculation. From here, guests next enter into the maintenance shop where they board the minecarts. Before the coaster ascends the lift hill, a scene plays out where the spirits attack. From here, the coaster moves up and out of the building before being dangled over the mine shaft where the guests can hear the spirits wailing. It finally drops and finishes the rest of the course. Baron 1898 might not be the most exciting B&M dive coaster and is actually one of the smaller models. However, I think the theming and story more than justify its existence and is a welcome addition to the park. At this point, Efteling has a pretty solid coaster lineup in addition to its other themed experiences. However, there is one last major ride to talk about. Efteling, like many theme parks, offers characters that are either roving or can be met in designated areas. In 1989, the park introduced a mascot for its marketing, a jester from the planet Symbolica named Pardos. While a popular icon and meet and greet character, he would finally get his own attraction in 2017. Aptly named Symbolica, this trackless dark ride manufactured by ETF Ride Systems brings guests into the Court of Hearts to meet with King Pardolphus. Guests eventually reach a pre-show where a character known as OJ Punctual reads the court rules out loud before meeting the king. Pardos interrupts and invites the guests on a magic journey through the rooms of the castle. He then casts a spell that splits the staircase in two, revealing a secret passage in dramatic fashion. When guests get to the station, they board the ride vehicles called Fantasy Floats. Before you board, guests can choose one of three routes, which are the Hero Tour, Music Tour, and Treasure Tour. The attraction has 11 scenes in total, but only 9 are shared, leaving a unique scene for each vehicle depending on which you choose. The ride vehicles also include an interactive dashboard for the front row, which is a touch control device that allows riders to interact with elements of the scenes. As the ride starts, guests are moved down a hall and into the first scene where they meet the Grand Magister Alomar, who is the mentor of Pardos. As you'll notice, the scenes of this attraction contain quite a bit of detail and impressive special effects. Pardos appears and evokes magic causing the observatory to become enchanted with star constellations appearing above the planetarium. The ride vehicles circle about and exit the observatory, moving next into a hall where enchanted butterflies can be seen, and then the vehicles move out onto a balcony, where a diorama of the city of Hartenstad can be viewed. Like Dreamflight, I appreciate that a diorama is used to evoke forced perspective on the audience here. When the scene concludes, the vehicles move backwards into the botanical, where magical plants are growing. Outside the glass panels, a large animatronic whale swims down and accidentally hits the glass with its tail, causing cracks to appear and water to start leaking in. The vehicles quickly move away and encounter Pardos again as he guides you to the appropriate tour that you chose. Once the vehicles are parked in these portals, which are all decorated differently depending on the tour you've chose, OJ Punctual will address the riders from somewhere in the room and inform them that the tour is cancelled. However, Pardos will reappear in the mirror 
conjuring up a key with the interactive help of the riders that will open the way into the next scene called the Hidden Fantasy Depot. If riders choose not to interact, the scene will play out regardless, although slightly differently. This scene also takes a picture of the riders as it plays out. Next, all the vehicles converge in this room, where cabinets full of enchanted objects come to life and each vehicle will end up in a scene unique to their respective tour. The treasure tour will come to a room where a large diamond is presented and reflected in the many mirrors. Here, riders can change the color of the diamond through the interactive dashboard. In the music tour, riders will encounter an organ that can be manipulated through the interactive feature. Finally, on the Heroes Tour, riders can interact with suits of armor that will battle each other. Once these scenes conclude, the vehicles move into the Champagne Passage, where audio cues and air bursts simulate the bottles popping. At the end of the passage, the palace chef is seen with a stack of pancakes that almost topple over. Finally, the guests all make it to the King's Hall, where a feast and a dance are in full swing. OJ Punctual lets his disapproval be known, but the king and his daughter welcome the guests to the feast. The vehicles begin to dance throughout the room, and Pardos enchants the party to make it even more lively. When the scene ends, the guests move into the gallery of the Fanciful, where their pictures are on display in the form of a painting, and from here, the attraction concludes. Not only is Symbolica a great addition to Efteling, but it's one of the best trackless dark rides ever created. In my second video that I ever published, I spoke about how underutilized the trackless ride vehicles are for Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway and Star Wars Rise of the Resistance. I noted how odd it was that these attractions were largely linear, and that there really wasn't any reason to use this type of ride system in them. In contrast, Symbolica serves as an example of how to do trackless rides right. Not only are the ride vehicles equipped to give you unique experiences depending on the path you chose, but the interactive element is a unique novelty that affects the physical environment around you. I also find the extensive details and practical effects far more enchanting. I never understood why people thought that Rise of the Resistance was so impressive with its over-reliance on projections and screens when we have experiences like this instead. Perhaps there are some discrepancies in animatronic quality, but I'm more interested in overall experiences rather than the smoothness of Kylo Ren's animation. To digress, Symbolica is a world-class addition to a world-class park. It's the next natural step in Efteling's Dark Ride roster, and it excites me for the potential of future attractions. Efteling is such an amazing park that offers so much more than what I even covered. I tried to give a bit of both history and commentary on some of the larger attractions that the park offers because I find the magical and fairy tale theming so intriguing. As a staple theme of the theme park industry, Efteling stands as the epitome of how to do fantasy correctly. There were a number of things I wanted to mention and go into detail with, such as this incredible looking show called Ravelin. This is definitely one of the more ambitious shows that I've ever seen created. The park also offers a number of well-themed and historic experiences, such as the building that houses the steam-powered carousel that dates back to 1895. The fairy tale forest, just by itself, is worthy of an entire video just exploring its various scenes and history. There are also a number of well-themed attractions that I never even mentioned, and I only just barely touched the park's entertainment and food options. What lessons can we learn from Efteling, though? In this era of high-profile and story-driven dark rides, the classics that focused on populating their scenes with details and animation have a lasting effect on audiences. Incorporating elements like wind, fog, or scent that helps immerse guests into the dense atmosphere of such attractions is something that seems to be lost in this newer era. Efteling also reveals a much stronger signature of creativity with an emphasis on attractions that impress and captivate their audiences, rather than shooting for cheap IP tie-ins. Efteling's brand isn't film characters. Instead, it's the quality and creativity that the park offers, because it seems to have a history of being run by people who actually care. 
Efteling, while fantastic, is definitely more obscure than the big players like Disney and Universal. Let me ask my audience this. Have you heard of Efteling before? If not, what do you think about the many attractions that I showcased here? If it's a park that interests you, there's so much more to discover about its history and attractions than what I cover here. As always, if you enjoy these types of video essays, I strongly encourage you to just quickly hit the like button. I try to post a video at least every two weeks, but as you can see with the more ambitious scope here, sometimes it takes a bit longer. Because of this, I also recommend hitting the subscribe button with bell notification so that you can be alerted when new videos are released, if you enjoy this type of stuff.